Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and the DevOps lunch of January 19th uh, was all about a couple of topics. Um, we, we talked about image-based deployments, which we we're going to have a follow-up on, the challenges of image-based deployments, and, and, and how things are changing on that part of the infrastructure management. And then we pivoted to infrastructure as code about 30 minutes in, and talked about collaboration, transparency, and empathy that's necessary to really build good organizational hygiene for infrastructure as code. Uh, it was a real thoughtful conversation that, that pulled together a lot of our other threads. Um, I think you'll find it highly, highly interesting. Um, please join us. These are designed to be casual conversations uh, over lunch on Tuesdays about DevOps and the industry. So uh, .23.cloud is the place for all those details. Thanks and enjoy the conversations. Um, this image build thing, it keeps coming mm -hmm. up more and more, oh, um, okay. um, over the last couple of weeks, Josh, I see you shaking your head. Are you hearing the same thing? Brother, I've been hearing the same conversation for How 20 years. years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know exactly. that's exactly, I mean, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's the, it's the same, it's the same desire. And the only thing changes is the complexity of the environments that people want that desired outcome. <laughs> Meaning yeah. they're going up. <laughs> and it's not hard. That's the well, thing. You just need a process. It is. Uh, wait, it well, is hard. No, no. I don't, what's I don't what's buy the, hard? The, the, Are we talking servers or endpoints? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <right? Either>. yeah. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the key thing that I've seen is that or, or I guess the, the biggest barrier that people run into isn't a technical one usually. Yes. It's, it's you have to acknowledge that you might not be able to ever get 100% depending on the depend dependencies that you have or yep. the requirements of whatever you need included in that image. And if you start with that and you accept that then you're already off to a great start yeah. to be successful um the number of times i've seen people say hey well we need to be able to provision this image against this whatever the platform whatever it is and it needs to be exactly the same every single time and have every single thing that the person needs i'm like okay Maybe yes, you should start Rob's a little company. bit smaller first yes. <laughs> because yeah, and if, if you could at least start with everybody getting the same operating system with the same installed dependencies and those things yeah. are the same, that already gets you really, really far. And then yeah. see, jo Josh, then when you say that. that, when you say that, all I go is as a person who's led organizations, I sit in my head goes, Hmm, sounds like, We've allowed technology for technology's sake run the way we should do business and how we should have consistency of, I, I think of enterprise architecture, have a consistent per department or per instance, have consistent desktop images based on job duty and task. That's the step in that right direction. I think I'm just saying. Well, yeah, I but think, then you have everybody adding their stuff and and then yeah, that's the problem. Somebody else, yeah. it's, yeah, it's, that's the know, problem. calling a different version of the same thing, and yeah. it's it's yeah. the Comanche issue, right? <laughs> you're familiar with with the Comanche, right? One of the most amazing helicopters ever developed, and then as as they were getting the development going people kept adding requirements to it and expectations to it that required uh, design uh, changes, yes, which yes. changed performance characteristics to the point that they took something that was stable and capable and they, they, they applied requirements to get it to do things it wasn't ever built to do because they wanted to attach that capability to that product. We fall into that same fallacy with the technologies we adopt today. Kubernetes. Uh, to the Bradley, to the Bradley <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and, and this goes to the thing that, you know, just recent conversations talking about images. And Rob, I know we're completely, you know, we, I, I feel like we need to have a whole session on this topic. Um, because, but, oh, yeah. but the, going back to the idea of, you know, the success of images is keep it simple, keep them as bare bones as possible. Don't build all these image types. Like, you know, I just went through a couple of years of trying to, trying to shape people's kind of methodology of thinking 
oh, I need to have an image for a web server. I need to have an image for a database server. I need to have an image mm. for this. I need to, versus I need one image that's stable. And then I bolt on what is required using Ansible or whatever your config management is by saying it needs to look like this and apply it to that base image. Uh, yeah, there's, and there's then so roll much. Forward. The, the thing is, we're, we're talking image, image, and the real reality is it's about process, right? It's process, yes. Um, yep. I mean, if you can't whiteboard it or if you can't describe yes. it succinctly, you can't image it. Exactly. <laughs> and I have a. The, that's also the difference. Go ahead. Go ahead. There's also the difference between managing images 10 years ago where a golden image was still practical versus yeah. now where you got updates potentially every day. Yep. Potentially every hour. Yep. Potentially, yeah. And that's the yeah. other thing is, you know, the, the, you know, we did all of our image builds and, and pipelines. So they were on a cadence of where new images were stamped out. And then you have that process. For, so for VMware people, um, being able to inject an image into vCenter and then have it tagged as latest and have an incremental rollback process as well. That way, if I inject an issue, I can easily go back. And I have yeah. artifacts along the way that dictate on what that build was. So if Rob deploys a web server and has issues, and we know what that artifact is, we can go back and look at the build and understand why did that what what was it that caused that issue? Um, but what being changed? able to have that came exactly what changed. What changed? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Nothing yeah. changed, Josh. You know that. <laughs> but at least it's in code and pipelines, you know, and everybody can say, "Hey, what is being done?" And then you nothing add changed. Audit. It's the network. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, now we're exactly. going full circle as as well, like with with container images. Which, yes. <laughs> yep. we're, we're, we're taking the we're taking the the OS golden images that that. We used to have, and we're praying it down to just what we need to run the stuff. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. In, in, interesting. Yeah, it was containers for better design from that perspective to to in, embrace that process. But it is very similar from a post config and boot process, things like that. One of the things I was noting is that um, Ubuntu twenty oh four actually eliminated it's a pain in the ass. Eliminated netboot. Yeah, like they to did. slim things down, they decided that they wouldn't do pre-seed anymore, and you yeah. can't netboot it. You have to image deploy it. Yep. Ooh. Um, and and it's a that. pain. Even going through Packer, I know that there's a lot of open issues um, from Packer, and it's interesting you brought that up, Rob, is that this has been going on for months from a Packer perspective, um, getting a consistent deployment on Ubuntu 20.04. Now I've gone through and for whatever reason, it works for me. I don't know why I've tried in different environments and everything. I've been successful getting 2004 deployed to V to V center using Packer Proxmox, mm -hmm. um, KVM, which obviously Proxmox is KVM for the most part. Yeah. Um, Vagrant, you know, different, different virtual box, VMware workstation fusion. I'm successful along the way. Um, others are getting stuck with Packer and I don't understand why. Um, but I've tried on different machines. I've tried on Linux. I've tried on Mac and I've got consistent results. So oh, I have two questions for you, Larry. Uh -huh. One is you've got, um, the repo out there, oh, yeah, um, yeah. but, but there are a lot of Larry Smith's out there. How do we oh, know no. which one is yours? The original Larry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, I worked for a guy named Larry Smith yeah, back exactly. in 1990 doing object-oriented databases. That was me, too. <laughs> <laughs> Same location. Um, I used, yeah. It was jun it Junior. Junior, okay. So, and mine is Mr. L.E. Smith, Jr. I use that on everything. <laughs> so I'm the original, I'm the OG. <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I can't remember what the other one was, but it was about, oh, it was, if Ubuntu is now fucked up, pardon my French, <laughs> what would be the recommended Linux to run on a laptop that's going to have pretty much everything running out of VMs so, and or containers? They're all, they're yeah. all. Ubuntu's fine. Wait, yeah, uh, Ubuntu 2004 it. is fine for a laptop. That's what mm -hmm. I, I use. And it's, it's perfectly legit. 
stable. It works. It's well supported. But this and it actually works it's really actually well. Acting as a it, server to remote storage and other things like that. I, but from a desktop perspective, it's fine. The the thing that we're complaining about is the pre seed. Oh, yeah. The pre seed is gone. Mm -hmm. So if like for us, we can install. Right, we, yeah. We install so as everything. an individual, it it. But when, as an individual, it doesn't matter at all. Your USB you key install, stuff, whatever. Yeah, no, what they what they did was they, they're, they're all clouds. So they eliminated the- um, Uses cloud boot. and knit now. Uses cloud yeah, and knit. Yeah, uses cloud and knit and curtain. Yeah. Wow. Which we use, we use curtain also, which is yeah. a, I, I, you could get my team and a cup of coffee and hear an hour worth of ranting about curtain. Um, <laughs> and I still want to hear that. Used to be uh, yeah, and actually, we need. Really. I need to bring them in and and, yeah. and have that conversation because you know when it, we we're doing image deploy stuff and like over the holidays we got ESX depl image deploy working, um, which is a huge leap forward mm -hmm. in how normally you install VMware. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, but curtain and curtains it trips people up from building an image perspective. Um, yeah, one of the interesting things I saw. Arch, we've done. Yeah, mm -hmm. Arch, I've done some Arch stuff what, as well. Arch. Wasn't there a thing with Ubuntu, like selling your data to Amazon a couple of years ago? Uh, it wasn't selling data. That what they did was they had uh, in their uh, I think what they called lens, basically their yeah. their search. They had uh, mm -hmm. that Amazon search uh, automatically enabled. So your searches on the desktop went to Amazon. Um, they had big backlash for that, uh, justified backlash, and they removed it. And I once tried installing Arch Linux. I thought you know it'd be just a good minimal Linux distribution, and I got into <laughs> the installer, and it's like partition your drive. Yes. And I'm like, okay, I know how to partition a drive. I mean, seriously, I've been doing this for 20 years. But no, I'm not going to right now partition my laptop to install Linux. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'll share another. I'll share another link with yeah. you guys. Um, some Packer stuff. Yeah, this stuff's fun. I mean, it's fun when you have nothing else to do, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll take this any day over Windows. Put it that way. I mean, you and I do the Windows job, thing. But yeah, I did it in Windows. <laughs> yeah. And I and I have to, and it's painful as hell. You know all the different iterations of auto unattend and all the other crap. And it's like, oh, <laughs> I mean, even back. As a matter of fact, I had a conversation. Josh, you'll appreciate this. Um, is it Riz Remote Installation Services or something like that? It used to be back in the day. Remember WinPE and all the we're going way back, way back, way back. All of the 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 process around building those images. Um, we, we had a conversation just recently where the, the company actually still uses that as a build process. Um, I was like, wow, you're shaking your head like I did. I'm like, why? There are much, much more efficient ways of doing this today. So it's, it's under, we actually came up, we don't do windows through NetBoot at all. Mm -hmm. The only the only way we support Windows installs is through an image deploy. Okay. Um, because the netboot process and the licensing are so painful to yeah. get together. What would happen is people would would have to go through multiple boot cycles, and it was just like we could do it. It just was so painful. We just said we don't support that. If you want to do image Windows deploys, install Windows. I mean, that's basically where we are with Ubuntu now with twenty oh four, and it's where you know, the fact is, image deploy is a is a better process. Period. Um, it's just as fast. It's faster, faster, it, way faster. Yeah, I mean, I've I mean, I've done you know for years just the whole Pixie TFTP built boot stuff, and I've written about it you know years ago on doing it for a VMware perspective, and nine times out of ten, it was usually faster over the wire, doing real time inline I mean, Pixie boot build. Go ahead, Josh. This isn't new. Right? Exactly. Go UCS. That's what yeah. it does. Yep. And and it's fantastic. We actually had a point where um, at SolidFire we had mm -hmm. toyed with the idea 
uh, and we had actually customers doing this to where they would take solid fire nodes um, from a cluster and they could switch it from being a solid fire node in a cluster to pixie boot it to use it for compute only and yep. data sit frozen and based on changes in capacity requirements they could nix it as a solid fire node automatically bring it back online as a as a uh, as a compute node for their compute cluster um we didn't really encourage this but at the same time it's like they're not changing the system they're just booting to a remote image running it and then killing it and then booting it back up and letting the system load you know reestablish the, the the data integrity so I mean, it's the interesting thing that people chose to do um I, but... I wish i'd have known about that i could have put some use to that solid fire or solid fires we had in, in production at one point <laughs> i mean it was really strange ago to do. yeah 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 I remember having solid fire. I think Josh, I think you and I got connected. Well, maybe before that, but um, you were at solid fire. I think um, there sort of been 2014, 2015. I think when we got solid fire in and used it. So a lot of fun. Good old days. That's right. <laughs> All right, Rob, what rabbit hole are we going down now? <laughs> And this um, is all why infrastructure as code is a bad idea. <laughs> what? Exactly. I do think we need to change the name of it, though. Okay, so wanted to point out that the Boeing giant rocket fire that was supposed to get us to the moon needed four minutes of fire, only got one minute, 15 seconds. They've traced the shutdown to software. Gee, who'd have thunk? <laughs> <laughs> Is this that big yeah. test they were doing in uh, in Mississippi? Yep, that one. Big the engine the engine test. Yep. Um, why they that's why they do an extended um, an extended one. Yep. Well, I hate to say it, but in in Boeing, I suspect who was in charge of this engine, uh, what somebody else posted seven thirty seven mass max, uh, they mm -hmm. they've given up on aerospace engineering discipline and they're just drinking whatever Kool-Aid they, they want to make things go fast and agile. Well, agile isn't particularly good for mission critical, uh, can't change it at the drop of a hat stuff. Yeah. I mean, you're not gonna be posting updates every day to the operating system of a satellite or a rocket to mars so just delete a spaceship and redeploy it <laughs> so as a uh, as as someone you, who Tom. holds a degree in aerospace engineering and has co-authored a paper on the concept of applying agile development principles to um you know similar infrastructure types um i'll, I'll say that the problem with the sls isn't uh isn't a software development problem it's the desire to reuse existing proven tested platforms in ways that they weren't intended to be used <laughs> i mean it's, it's kind of on theme with with other things we've talked about today oh, yeah. oh, um yeah. because the the only requirement that they really received in transitioning from the shuttle program to this program is you have to keep all the same contractors employed. What? So, oh yeah, that was I, look, okay. NASA. NASA through through you know as yeah, you might expect sense. from our congressional leaders, part of the reason why SpaceX has able to iterate so much quicker than yeah. say someone like NASA and their programs is because NASA like Boeing have these distributed um workforces like the the workforce is distributed and it's yeah. mainly done for political reasons or through um mm. uh, adhering to political processes um or right. oversight and regulations so you know while that test fire you know that test fire happened in mississippi for a reason yeah. and it's because it's someone it. in a political spectrum made sure that it did uh, not because Senate, there was Senator Stennett. No, it's there was no accident that that because that I've been there. Right, I used to live in New Orleans, 
That is a NASA facility in the middle of friggin' nowhere. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator nowhere. Shelby. <laughs> on so, the, thank you, Senator the, Shelby. On the, I was on the on space the... station in 1989, and we were working on various aspects. At some point, pretty much everything stopped because there was a need for West Virginia to have part of the space station contract. NASA figured out there was this software that this one company in West Virginia was capable of writing. So the contract was put out there and the competition occurred. And it turns out that another company moved two employees to West Virginia, filed the uh, RFP response mm -hmm. from West Virginia and beat out the West Virginia company. And nobody knew what to do. Everything got put on hold again because West Virginia still didn't have a piece of the space station contracts. And that was back in yeah. 89. We had the same problem with the, the uh, heat distribution. Uh, it was made in one place and it had to be redesigned because some other states companies needed to get to have it instead of us. So we had to actually give them the design so that they could make it so that it wouldn't put the system behind too much. It's like, uh, uh, you know, it's, in, it's interesting because I want to offer a counterpoint. I was doing a one on one Club 2030 podcast interview with um, uh, some of y'all might know him, Ian Ray at a Cloud Ops, Cloud Canada. Um, and one of the things that was is interesting here is that the balance between efficiency and, you know, basically spreading out innovations, you know, smaller companies and things like that. And we, we do get into this trap of, you know, rushing it and doing things really efficiently and versus, you know, more longer term thinking. And there's a, well, you know, it's easy in a, in my instinctual reaction is like, yeah, they should not do that. It's like, well, but wait a second, actually congregating, you know, all of, all of that knowledge into one place, maybe, you know, it doesn't make sense. And we need to rethink that because the, the place where we went from that was like, all right, if the, how fast you can build infrastructure is your number one criteria for getting infrastructure, then yeah, it's all going to go into Amazon really, you know, really fast because they, they're just, building servers and infrastructure faster. So just get over it. Um, and that, that answer to me, I understand. And there's a part of me that's worried about the trend line. So I, I you know, it's, yeah, I want to, I want us to have big rockets and I want them built really fast and cheap. That's important, but it's, there's a part of me that's like, maybe we're timeline, maybe we're, we're, we're creating a race where it's not the right thing to do. I don't know. Yeah, well, and that was that was going to be my my second point to to add actually is along those lines is it's less about how these things are built and where things are sourced and whether it's centralized or distributed, it's how you respond when you need to respond quickly. Um, that happen that goes with we'll go with the space program as an example. One of the most impressive things to me has been seeing how SpaceX is capable of identifying a problem with the rocket during a test and have a patch or have a fix done in a matter of hours or days. Um, whereas we don't see that in these larger distributed contracted um, mm -hmm. environments. We don't see it in that way because there's a lot more friction in those processes. And when we talk, I'm talking, please give me a minute. Okay, thank you. Um, and then when we see these processes applied to, for instance, like fighter jets, right, they will still, they, they use and apply agile principles for the F-35 fighter jet. And their point is not that they feel the requirement to update that software on the jet every day. They don't do that. They have like the F-22 for, or F-35 has three versions of software on it at all times. And that is so that they can transition and test mm. and validate um, on the fly and, and have a, a redundant, very established version that they can drop to if they need to. Um, but their, their intent is to ensure that if they identify an issue, 
that they can get a fix to that issue out as quickly as possible to keep everybody operational ready. How quickly can they reboot to the, the safe uh, version? I, I don't remember specifics, but it's, it, it's pretty quick. I mean, um, I don't think they try to do it in the air, but I'm confident that they have. <laughs> okay, so that, that was what my, my wondering is, because that thing doesn't fly without uh, software. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the rock, yeah. so no, they're brave. You have to wire. fall back, you know, the fail safe, if the fail safe is actually the, the fail OS, that's actually, and they can do it and still salvage the, the bird if something goes wrong by failing over to the reliable. Well, that's pretty cool. I, I, would, <laughs> yeah. I would suspect, I mean, the, the space shuttle had multiple parallel control systems right and so yes. if you were building a fighter plane you're going to do exactly the same thing because you could have a stray bullet take out a control system yeah but you also have things on those fighter planes which i found interest fascinating i had a friend who used to do computational fluid dynamics and they are doing dynamically uh configurable inlets and outlets on those jets to keep them flying yeah. And yeah. it's it's just amazing, but it also is scary as hell. Well, so let me let me make it a little less scary, right? So one of the, the key components of fly by wire systems, right, where you don't have cables and hydraulics that are being controlled physically by Thankfully. the stick, but it's electronic, <laughs> right? Those systems work as a like a subsystem or overlying system, right? So those systems, hi mom. Um, those systems actually are treated more like APIs, right? So that software that I was describing earlier is controlling software, but it's it's executing against the software stack that is the fly-by-wire, right? Mm -hmm. It's sending uh, okay. the adjustment stuff to to a, a a subsystem, right? So the flight control system is actually you know the the actual mechanical control that is executed by across the wire is it can actually be controlled by a separate piece of software. And so mm -hmm. they can be independent in that. Right. So it's very, it's very cool. similar of, you know, of, um, you know, what we do with, with application and, and real and systems software. engineering. <laughs> well, and, and that's the thing I try to explain to people, right. Um, particularly with complex systems, like those models, don't change a whole lot. <laughs> they just get applied in different ways. And then yeah. people think they're gonna like make some grandiose change in how those systems are gonna run. It's still the same thing. <laughs> just gets a new label. Yeah, but Josh, you know we just reinvented a whole new way of doing things. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I not yeah, because that Rocket, that rocketry is code. About, should that's that be old exactly. stuff. It can't exactly. be very good. <laughs> exactly. We didn't invent it, so it can't be very good. <laughs> Come on, you bunch of boomers! You know uh, <laughs> that is uh, the the. This is it. Is actually interesting. Um, I would take Larry had said something about infrastructure is good, and I would take us back to that if you if y'all want. And, and just as a as a side note, right? Part of to me with these lunches is is the ability for us to sit down and talk about anything. If if somebody has a, I have topics that I could we could bring in, but I actually like the connecting and talking and geeking out. Um, as a as a thing, um, and we still need to do our book or do our book club. Uh, I'm horrible about staying on topic, but we we um, we talked a lot about infrastructure as code before the before Thanksgiving timeframes, and uh, I had a revelation over the holidays about how all that stuff boils down. Like we had like a grid and we had a matrix and we have these key principles for infrastructure as code. And I, I thought about it all, and this is related to the rocket stuff, it's, it's junk. In that the purpose of infrastructure as code is to collaborate. Yes. And all of the principles, everything that we talk about like repos and that state infrastructure and all, all everything else, which I still believe is core to the tech. If if you're not figuring out how to collaborate around those things first, that's why you're doing it. The purpose is to is not to automate systems, right? You could automate systems with bash files and like the Kubernetes. Like the Kubernetes community is just hard coding everything and go, um, which yep. will work. 
Um, but the point here is that you're trying to create systems that allow you to collaborate around the automation. So um, actually what it, it is, Rob, yeah. it's because all those software geeks think software is documentation. So it's really infrastructure is documentation, but you have to do it in code because the software geeks don't know how to do it if it's uh, not code. Yeah, I think. Well, but, but there's, there's, more, there's more to it than that. Like the idea, the, the idea that I'm putting my automation in source code control, it's like, yeah, hey, I want it in source code control. It's like, why? Well, the reason you do it is because you're actually collaborating around what gets released into your infrastructure and having a person be able to review it and check it. Um, well, right, so there's, there's all sorts of benefits, but if they all come back, you know, that I've started just connecting them all back to collaboration, right? When you start talking about why, hey, why should a CIO care that they're going to implement infrastructure as code processes? And it's like, well, because at the end of the day, your teams need to collaborate better around your infrastructure and they need to be able to get help from external parties around your infrastructure. And that's, I'm, and I'd like to add, Rob, ahead, I'd Josh. Like to argue that that collaboration is actually derivative. Um, oh. that really transparency is the key. That's what I was going to say. Yes. Without, without, because, you know, I've, I've done data center automation in the past and yeah. it, it is, you know, this executes, things happen and then an outcome occurs. And particularly in the infrastructure space where people, um, utilize infrastructure without understanding infrastructure it's akin to magic and there's no transparency or awareness of how things got from point a to point z and infrastructure as code provides an opportunity for complete transparency on what is happening and how you get from point a to point z as a result you're then yeah, able yeah. to be collaborative in how you improve um, how you improve those processes um, or, or how you explain and hold yourselves accountable for the outcomes of those processes. And I'm and glad you hit that because I was actually going to go there as well because that's one of the things that I see as well is that it is about mm -hmm. transparency. It's about being transparent on what is going on so there's accountability. And then also at the same time, kind of like Josh was saying, it's about getting collaboration. The goal is to collaborate, to get others to buy into what's going on, but also to contribute to it. Yeah. But the prob the problem still or the, the problem still is that those that don't want to collaborate, they still want to hold near and dear to their heart because they're doing a thing that they feel is is more important and don't want to go for the overall objective. You know what I'm saying? So and they don't want go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say from hmm. Keith's perspective, it's, yeah, what if my guy gets hit by a bus? Exactly. So from the CEO perspective. <laughs> so many buses. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It, it, it is, a, is this a valid point, though, like that, that there is a knowledge transfer component there. Like you, you, you write yes. your infrastructure as code so that you enable someone hmm. with less knowledge than yourself to reproduce what you just deployed. Yep. And then or let's add- go, Attempt go ahead, to understand it with uh, out having you sitting there over the shoulder. <laughs> but I, and I still though go back to part of the collaboration piece is I wanna reuse other people's code. I wanna bring in yes. new pieces, right? Cause that's right, John, I, John, I totally agree. It's a transparency is a huge thing, right? I, I've, I've been a big fan of demagicking infrastructure or at least when you write automation, you need to be able to watch the gears turn. It's always a test to me. Um, and, and yet, uh, it could be very transparent code and you could be, but you can't share it, right? I watch, you know, we've been talking about Terraform or Ansible and nobody can pick up somebody else's playbooks and really use, reuse them or let alone parts of them. And so- and that's yeah. There's no, you can't collaborate, like you could collaborate like, oh yeah, so we put a Terraform plan into a, into Git and my team can use it, yeah. but nobody, if I, nobody else can reuse what I've done out of that plan. It's where I, and if somebody changes the stuff I depend on, then it breaks what I did, right? That, you know, I, I, oh my God, you, you, you Terraform apply a new thing. They pull down a new provider and the provider changed syntax somewhere that broke your whole infrastructure and i and so i ran thing, into this Rob, Go ahead, Rocky. reuse Go ahead, still isn't there you know until we have all this stuff 
documented in repos. We can't have reuse, but we still don't have the, the standardization, the, the process, the uh, discipline to actually get to the reuse. So there's just so much code out there that's used once and done when with when yes. we get to the next level, we'll be able to sit there and go, oh, this is applicable to these other places. Let's get everything working on the same thing. And then you have to connect it all back in so that there is one source of truth. Part of the you, issue you, is right. yeah. Uh, yeah. infrastructures code as anything yes. else, you still need to find a way back to one source of truth. And that's, I, and the, that's, that's, that's the what key. drives me nuts. Yeah. yeah. If you, if you, if you don't have a feedback cycle, you don't have reuse, you have borrow. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Or cut and, and pasting. Keith, right. yep. and, I, and I was going to bring this up. Keith was part of a large operation with myself. I always go back to this engagement that Keith on here has been involved in. One of the things that we as an I and Keith tried to, to push was collaboration and, and basically building that whole universe where people shared right within the, the environment there was a lot of pushback um because of certain individuals or teams um that did not want to participate in that in the enterprise right because it was um keith you want to add to that any um from from your perspective well, yeah i just because i'm listening to this everything and, and I, yeah. we've had this conversation before it, For years, yeah. to me this is ill it's ill-equipped organizational design and what i mean by that is hmm. the infrastructure is co code and the reason why i think it's gotten where people have talked about changing the name same thing with devops people are like yeah it doesn't fit anymore it's not inclusive <laughs> enough it's not broad enough all of it is is because we're these are techniques to achieve an end what I always draw us back to this whole conversation of what is it you're trying to achieve as an organization and design an organizational construct to achieve that goal, right? And you can use infrastructure as code, you can use iterative development, you can use waterfall. I don't care what you use as a methodology of achieving that goal, but yeah. the construct of organization should be things like open transparency, celebrate your failures, um, we are peers, work as peers as a collective team, reuse of work. So that means that you are mm -hmm. constructing work in a way that can be picked up by someone as long as they understand the technology being used. It should be done in a consistent way that makes sense. So we have documentations back to Rocky's point that says this is how we do this thing. This is how we create playbooks. This is how playbooks will function. This is how we do item potency among playbooks within the pipeline. The, and these are the, and what Larry was indicating is these are some of the issues that we had trouble with. People love infrastructure as code because it's like, ooh, I'm a hardware engineer, but I get to do coding. Yay, I'm now a developer. But one of the hardest things that we tried to do is, uh, did I see Josh out there? Um, one of the things that we tried to do was institute the concept of no. Um, I'm sorry, let me back up. Because one of the things you end up having was these system engineers that would basically go, okay, let me go figure it out, do my little stuff, to, and then I'll write the code. And one of Larry's pet peeves is, as from an automation perspective, no, you write it all the way through, you step through your code, hello, and then when you find the right solutions, it's already there. We had one guy who every time we were dealing with Moss, every time he went through a rebuild, he had to refigure out how he solved the problem that he had before. Yeah. Yep. I, and yeah. That, that's because he would not understand or adopt the automation principles that we've talked about. So to me, it's we as engineers, and you guys know I say this all the time, we're our world worst enemy. We have to step back and look at infrastructure as code is not an organizational construct. It's a method of achieving a goal using a technique or tools of tech or a combination okay. of techniques in order to accelerate your adoption at, of the endpoint. Yeah. The idea is to have an organizational construct, transparency, teamwork, mm -hmm. celebrate your failures, collaborate. All those things are organizational constructs that will allow for or infrastructure as code or DevOps as a total principle to excel. And I think oh, Josh, you but, wanted to add something there. Well, yeah, because 
I spent a lot of years automating primarily with PowerShell. I have a I have a repo private with thousands of scripts uh, that are useless. Like I, I, I go back, I can go back now and look at them and I might be able to pull one clever bit that I did something in there that is repeatable, reusable. Um, the challenge being, and I'll, I'll liken this because this is an extension of what Keith's talking about. Um, while I was at Cisco, I would write um, automation scripts or tool, you know, scripts to help automate some of our most common um maintenance tasks that we'd have to do. Now, most of those maintenance tasks would happen with a team that existed in India. And these were phenomenal administrators. They did great work. And I would write and test and validate that the script would work. And I would submit it to them for their, their uh, maintenance window, which started at like 10 p.m. Right, Eastern time. And um, Around eleven o'clock, they would call me and tell me it was it was okay for me to run the script now. <laughs> because after you just gave it to them, and yes. I'm like, no, this is for you to run. Oh well, yes. we're, not, we're not going to do that because we don't we don't want to mess anything up. It's like, nope, yep. it's tested, validated, it works. What I learned is that I needed to provide, I needed to bridge the gap of their understanding and the capabilities of the automation. So I learned that basically I needed to provide a prompt that all it said was, you are about to execute maintenance this on this target. Would you like to proceed? Yes. That's, That's all they needed. needed. Right? They needed validation. But they needed that to feel yeah. like it worked within the, the framework that they, now over time, several of the, those folks got more comfortable. But when we think about things, for instance, like infrastructure as code, we need to remember that to Keith's point, we have to have very specific defined outcomes that everybody is agreeing that we're moving towards. And to garner the type of collaboration and consistency, we need to recognize that the level of skill, knowledge and awareness of how we get to an infrastructure as code, um, like uniform framework, um, not everybody's gonna get there. Um, and, and hmm. What, the biggest example of this that I share when I present and talk about automation is if you're not sure about that, just watch any person who does a, a, a demonstration of their automation tool or whatever it is. They'll go in the console and they'll execute it and then they'll pull up a GUI to prove that it worked. Yeah, you should never do that. <laughs> I'm just like, you should have comfort. Don't do that. <laughs> yep. And, and you bring up a valid point because I went through a series of, you know, the a ACI automation you know from a cisco perspective yep. and you know talking about the automation you know from from ground up completely deploy a full fabric all the way through the first thing that people outside of the team that was doing the automation the first thing they wanted was that web interface they, they wanted the validation that it was working rather than watching that it was actually working and saying we've already put this into pipelines we know this works we know the results we've tested validated they still had to have that validation. But the other thing I want to add. Well, and I don't, I don't see that as a problem. Go ahead, Larry. But I don't, yeah, I don't. No, I mean, it, I, it's one of those things. Maybe the scenario is a little bit different, but it, but it's one of those things where, you know, unless you're comfortable with, you know, those of us that have done automation, I can't log into a, a vCenter interface and navigate it. I can't. I can't log into an ACI fabric and navigate it. I can automate the hell out of it though, because I know all of the API endpoints. I know all the different mm -hmm. things I need to do to get the goal, get to the goal, right? The goal isn't just that single thing. It's the collaborative thing across the board, the holistic view. But the thing yeah. I wanted to add, and then I'm gonna hand it back to you, Rob, is you made a comment about not being able to reuse playbooks and things like that. Mm -hmm. I What we saw, again, this goes back to Keith, you know, and what we saw is that too many of, let's just say us, when we get into automation, we only look at the thing in front of us, right? We don't look at the bigger picture of how we develop automation skills, how we develop the automation tasks, what they look like long-term. So I only look at, I need mm -hmm. to do this thing. I don't care about anybody else outside of that. And I don't care what it looks like six months from now. 
were those skills that I think that we need to get better at is that we've got back to Josh's point. We're not doing anything different than what we've done manually for 20 plus years. We're just being able to automate those things. And we know what it takes uh, to get from here to there. We need to bridge those gaps to make things more portable and usable with less friction across. This is, this is, this to me comes back to the, a lot of the tools that we use were designed to solve individual problems on individual systems. They, they, they weren't designed to Josh's point with collab with transparency to my point yep. with collaboration, right? Yep. They, those were added after the fact. Um, they weren't, yep. they weren't the first, they weren't the, the transparency and collaboration, I think are critical to building good automation systems and organ, you know, it's an organizational, they support the organizational design. Yep. Some of what you're, what you were talking about to me is um, an empathy. And I, I, I saw an SRE con talk that was really good about, about empathy, automation, empathy. Mm -hmm. um, and Josh, like your thing about, Hey, I, before something starts, I want it to, to treat me, you know, ask me a question, acknowledge my, my anxiety before the, the thing runs or, you know, Hey, something big, I set up automation, something big's happening, having the UX, having a UX to, you know, have empathy with me, my anxieties as the operator to see that it happened. I don't think is, is wrong. Um, but it's, it's, there's a dimension in, in a lot of these automations, automation systems that we, we don't acknowledge. It's, it's um, a perspective where who is the user versus who is the developer. If it's an operator, you need to actually design with the operator's perspective in mind. Yes. And yep. so if, if you're, you're doing it, then you're going to use the console. But if it's an operator, you want these extra cues because you didn't write it. So you need some sort of communication. So uh, along those Trusting, lines, yeah. it's a an individual tool versus a an organizational tool. An organizational tool has to have more cues in it. So Rob, I, I would, yeah. uh, I'm glad you put that empathy down and I would like to extend empathy the way it has been described here beyond the warm and fuzzy, right? Um, mm -hmm. Empathy is not just, ah, you know, let me take quote unquote feelings into account. I'm, I'm not talking about that, right? Generally, if you're managing a very large, broad software development lifecycle internally, um, I'd like people to regard empathy as, well, what is it, the specific build that I am, so forget infrastructure, just a large software development cycle. Yeah. Anything that I'm building, a component within the software, right? If I'm responsible for a library, a self-contained library, as far as I'm concerned, how that interacts with the larger software code, um, as long as all the contributors to each library as it exists, where it falls in the larger software build, um, I regard that as empathy as well. Now, you know, people try to do it with software contracts, um, what they're building, what component they're building. But this is where you're able, this happens, you know, this anxiety happens as is. Uh, but if people understand yeah. where the component is that they're building in the entire large software stack and what the dependencies, not necessarily what the exact dependencies are, uh, because that becomes very hard in large software process, right? What, where, the, where, the, where the potential dependencies could, could be, that I regard as empathy as well, right? If you regard how we do cloud builds now, um, somebody that is perhaps doing an upgrade or like to incorporate a new IAM build in their Terraform provider, they need to have this empathy that, you know, where exactly are all the secrets that are managed within um, whether that is, you know, there are touch points within Vault, what the what other components could it perhaps inter interface with? This is where it helps. So you know, before I go on and proceed, hey, I got to talk to my IAM team as well, um, because this is where the failures will happen. If I go ahead and then change what my tokens are, or you know, if I incorporate new tokens within my serverless build, ah, uh, I got to make sure I actually talk to the IAM guys as well. No, the, the, I mean we're laughing. No, it's uh, I, I'm, I'm I regard laughing that as a part of empathy as well. It's so important. So it absolutely is, and and you know this is where you say uh, collaboration really really matters 
yes, collaboration matters, right? If you look at the whole, you know, that Mobius strip of a DevOps lifecycle uh, that people really talk about, each person is responsible, well, each team is responsible for different parts of that life cycle. Well, there are lots of other little circular loops that go on in each build process. You have to know, you know, what you're taking in and what you're impacting in that whole DevOps life cycle. Yeah. It's a lot easier for me to understand that because people who have managed, you know, software development life cycles, very complex software builds, it, it, it's intuitive to us. Um, so, I don't necessarily like this demark as, you know, empathy should just be, well, are you an operator versus are you a database build guy? Are you a database performance guy? Um, all that can collapse into if you regard all of it as a large software development build. Um, there could be components to it, sure, that are very hardware centric, hardware focused. But if you start kind of abstracting even the hardware builds, as these are just abstractions, regard them as just software builds. Yep, um, just objects in the environment. Yeah, uh, as, as software builds. And you know, what, what am I doing when I change this? Who are perhaps the touch points? Now, you're going to be very hard pressed to find one PM, one product program manager that will understand all of this and they'll take on the responsibility. Oh, you know, I'll manage all these uh, different iterations that are going on uh, and I have to make sure that all of them match. Um, unless you have this comfort level between every person that's participating in it, um, you, you get that freedom. And Josh, to your point where you started talking about, you know, uh, just maintenance scripts, um, I saw something very similar, but in reverse. Uh, I was at EMC, we had our software build team in India and, you know, somebody higher up decided to take the dev part of the build team in India and just bring it over to China. The China team was just doing automation. Uh, unit test regression tests and all of a sudden they were responsible for freaking development um yeah. so it was trial by fire you know how to get them to be in a development mindset uh, because all they knew was how to run unit test scripts that is it and now they were being burdened by oh yeah we, we're not getting shelled and scripts we're telling you what to actually write <laughs> you're not writing automation scripts anymore <laughs> um, so to bring it full circle with infrastructure as code. Yep. I think the biggest challenge along infrastructure as code and Rob touched on this earlier and I know uh, Larry had made reference to this. Um, it really comes down to a lack of empathy from the infrastructure providers and understanding the ramifications of the changes that they make to their code, to their APIs. Um, yeah. I tell you, one of the biggest selling points I ever, and it was funny because the product managers at SolidFire, um, some of them were like, why are you talking about this? Um, it was the fact that we had side-by-side -side APIs. We had every API for a SolidFire system existed in code and was accessible um, in perpetuity, like every version of code they had. So all I had to do was to tell my, my strongest automation supporters for SolidFire, like just hard code to the version that you have. And it doesn't matter. You can update the SolidFire system. And I'm, I'm using SolidFire as an example, but this is an example of you know, how you can be empathetic to consumers for infrastructure as code. But you just hard code to the, to the version that you validated and tested. You can still provide all the updates to the software you know, indefinitely without changing your, your um, infrastructure automation. Um, we don't see that very often right and, and instead we say these changes to your automation are gatekeepers to you being able to take advantage of whatever the latest greatest features and in our case you know we released an update that improved efficiency like 25 percent. that's huge like that means millions of dollars yeah. for some people but if you weren't going to be able to upgrade your automation framework to take advantage of that Yep. That's awful. It's horrible. So, yeah, you know, yeah. good, good design principles that I've started to use is yes, Terraform gives you providers. So you can have specific providers, but you know, if people don't have an appetite, right. Uh, they say, no, you know, we don't want multiple providers because you know, how do we manage all this? Um, and this is part of where the education comes in. You know, you can start even in the build push, you can start pushing out feature flags and start yep. telling people, Hey, these are what will become relevant to you. So, you know, give them, some comfort level, month, two month, a quarter ahead, they start seeing these flags turn switched off. But 
they know what they are writing to. As a reminder, while the next build that they are building to, they exactly know how the other part of the code is going to use it because they're not you know, active, but still they show up as feature flags. So it's any new developer that they bring on, even that person out of curiosity should be asking, hey, I know it's switched off, but what is this? You know, what are we, this is where empathy comes in, right? Always have some kind of a forewarning that this is where, what we are all building towards. And oh, by the way, make sure you hard code those versions of providers and Ansible versions <laughs> and all those. Let's just no. go there. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, all right. I we are we are we are way over and I, I need us to wrap it up so I can you like how uh, I brought that home uh, again. So I can stay on schedule. But <laughs> I, I love actually I love how this conversation turned because I, I think we we've gone this is a really meaningful infrastructure as code conversation and I, I really appreciate everybody's uh, thoughtfulness on this. This is this is what it's really really about and is how we have to explain yeah. things. So